All the glory to the name of the Lord in this place. Have everybody in the house. Thank you for coming to church. Hallelujah. We're going to have a great time together in the presence of the Lord. Please bring your faith. Bring your expectations over to this technology so we can have a great time together in the presence of the Lord. And every joint is going to supply by the grace of God. Welcome, welcome to church. This is church at Hero Smart. And Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations. In keeping with the instruction of Yahushua in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you to do. And surely I will be with you till the end of the age. And in keeping with this instruction, this ministry, God's given us the great privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. That resource we titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. Now, the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which make a section of the five major categories of studies. The pharmacist section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And in coming through the 2022 ODP, God's given us the grace to come through the pharmacy aspect of it, which are going to be a certain collection, collection of certain scriptures and concepts, to return our hearts back to the childlike attitude, which is going to be heaven ready. Uh, uh, Jesus said somewhere in the Gospels, says, except you turn around and be like little children with their attitude, you're not going to make it over to heaven. So we packaged a couple of scriptures like that together. We call it pharmacy section of the word. Then in finishing the pharmacy section of the word, we went straight into the milk section of the word. The milk section of the word of God are going to be things talked about like in 1 Peter chapter 2 which says, desire the sincere milk of the Word so you can grow thereby. And the Word of God gives us a catalog of those milk studies in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, talking about the milk of the Word will include repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, the laying of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So we come through that study as well. We call it the milk of the Word in the ODP. And after finishing the milk of the word, we went into the solid food aspect of the word of God, which are going to be certain critical aspects of the priestly ministry of the believer in the New Testament. Because the believer has been called not just to be a king in Christ Jesus, the believer has been called to be a priest in Christ Jesus. The word of God says that we are royal priests in Christ Jesus. So when you start embracing the priestly aspects of your ministry and you understand the spiritual implications of the tabernacle of Moses, no longer the physical implication of the tabernacle of Moses because we live in the New Testament right now and the Old Testament is a shadow of things talked about. Now the spiritual implications of those things are going to be important. The way you pray in the Spirit, the way you generate incense from your belly, no longer physical incense, but spiritual incense coming out of you, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, and all those kind of concepts. When you start talking like that, you're getting into the meat of the Word, which is going to be inclusive of spiritual warfare as well. We talked about all of that, we packaged it together as the meat of the Word. And then we went into a water section of the word, which um, is going to be a certain collection of concepts to renew our minds, to wash our minds, so we can see ourselves the way God sees us. Uh, the book of Ephesians talked about it. It says that Jesus is going to come and he's going to wash the church with the washing of the water by the word. We talked about that. Uh, last year, by the grace of God, we finished on the water section of the word. And guess what? Today we are going to move it on to the last aspect of 2022 ODP called Combination Meals. Glory to God. And this is going to be uh, where we start talking about everything put together in a package to help us to see where we are with regards to the end time events happening in our generation by the grace of God. So we're going to get started with combination meals today with week number 48, end time snapshot, part one. Glory to God. And there are going to be five messages in this series. There's going to be end time snapshot, part one, part two, and part three, and part four, and part five. And these are going to be a collection, collection of studies that have been well taught, well thought about, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as we look through the pages of the Bible. 
which God has shown us in this ministry for a number of years right now, to let us know where we are in the grand scheme of God's events. Because how many people know that the Word of God says that we do not know the day and the hour that the Lord's going to return? But then the Bible says that you got to know the season of it. So he says you are not in darkness, that the day of the Lord will catch you unawares. We may not know the day or the hour, but he didn't say you're not going to know the season therein. you got to know the season therein. And the Word of God says that the men of Issachar, they understood the times, and they are able to tell Israel what to do. So God's not going to be um, very enthused with the body of Jesus, the body of the Messiah, and sticking their heads, heads in the sand, uh, waiting for the troubles of life just to pass unawares over their head. No, God wants us to understand where we are in the grand scheme of end time events. And we've been hearing about the end time events ever since I was a kid. <laughs> Growing up, um, I, 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 I've been walking with the Lord for about 34 years right now, since 1988. Um, they told us, well, Jesus is going to come in 1988, get ready, we're going home. And then, in fact, some of us got born again because of that, because they told us, well, you don't get born again. You're going to get left behind the Antichrist, it's going to ring your nose. I said, well, okay. So what do we need to do right now? We've got to get born again. Okay, we are going to get born again by the grace of God. And we started, I started talking about it, and then, yeah, we, 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 uh, I got born again because of that. But in 1988 came and went, um, Jesus hadn't come back. And then they came back and they told us, well, you know what, Jesus is going to come back in 1999. And then 1999 came and Jesus didn't come back just yet. Well, they said, Y2K, we're going to be going home in Y2K. Well, get ready, the, the word of the Lord, and God's going to be coming in Y2K. Well, Y2K came, Jesus hadn't come back. And in 2015, some of our friends, and <laughs> they came out of the woodworks and said, we saw the blood moon right now. Well, the blood moon is going over there. We've seen the blood moon right now. Get ready, 2015, we're gonna, Jesus is going to come back. Well, 1988 came, Jesus didn't come back. <laughs> and Y2 came, he didn't come back. 2015, the rapture still hasn't occurred. And... If you are going to be like an honest, hearted person, you're going to start asking questions. It seems like, you know, our ministers are missing it in the 21st century. In fact, you're going to talk to the unbelieving community. If you were to tell them Jesus is going to come back tomorrow, they're going to start laughing at you. <laughs> they say, you said that last year, it didn't come. Leave me alone. I'm going to enjoy my life. Well, I, you know, they're going to start laughing at you. <laughs> and I, I reckon with where they are because, you know, God is the author of logic. Um, the, the Heavenly Father is not random in his operation. Um, he talks about the ways of the Lord are deep. So there are certain ways that God operates. But the ways of the Lord are going to be available if the people of God seek the face of God in meekness. If our seminary holders, they are going to be thinking of, you know, going to multiple seminaries and, you know, trying to do eschatological studies which are going to be end time event studies, without the help of the Holy Spirit, of course, they are going to miss it. History proves that. They missed it multiple times over for the past 30 years. Actually, for the past 60 years, ever since uh, 1948 events in the nation of Egypt, they've been missing it, left, right, and center. So that lets us know that understanding God's events and God's ways goes beyond intellectual curiosity. It goes beyond that. There is somebody called the Holy Spirit who needs to guide you into all the truth before you can discover God's, God's thoughts and God's plans for the end. And when our people in the body of Christ discount go into the Holy Spirit in humility, they are going to miss the left, right, and center over there just like that. Why? Because there's an influence of lying spirits in the atmosphere. Because how many people know that God talks and the devil talks as well? So some guys telling us Jesus was going to come in 1988, well, I don't know who they heard that from. They heard that from some spirit or whatever, but they missed it. But by the grace of God, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is a consequence of a surge in humility and in meekness 
Go into the Holy Spirit one step after another to understand logically what the, what the Father plans on doing to close the age. We're going to be talking about what is the end time to start with. The end time is not going to be the end time just simply because people are talking about it. And the end time is not going to just going to be the end time just because we're seeing earthquakes and pestilences and plagues in our generation. Even though those are going to be pointers to the end time. Because if you were to talk to an unbeliever right now and you say, well, can't you see earthquakes? Can't you see pestilences? We are in the end time. And a dark and unbeliever, especially an intellectual unbeliever, is going to challenge you. He's going to tell you, well, there were earthquakes in the Old Testament. Didn't you see earthquakes? <laughs> In the wilderness, how the earthquake swallowed up a bunch of people over there. Well, it wasn't the end time 4,000 years ago. And if you challenge him, you say, well, then, then the Matthew 24 talks about whether it's going to be pestilences and plagues in the end time. And intellectual unbeliever is going to challenge you as well. He's going to tell you there were pestilences in Egypt and there were plagues in Egypt. And that was well over 4,000 years ago. And Jesus hadn't come. The end time hasn't started 4,000 years ago. So if you challenge, if you get challenged numerous times, multiple times, like the, the unbeliever, especially the intellectual community that I deal with, they're going to weaken your faith. If you don't get revelation from the Holy Spirit, which <laughs> your adversaries, in quotes, cannot gainsay. And that's what you're going to get from the end time snapshot today. So I'm not going to tell you that we are in the end time just simply because we're seeing pestilences and plagues in the end time. Even though those are going to be important. Especially if you're a believer and you don't have that locks of hardness in your heart like the unbeliever, the unbelieving community. Of course, we can see an escalation of earthquakes and, and plagues and pestilences on the outside. Definitely, those are pointers. But fundamentally, that's not the reason we are in the end time. When you talk about them, I'm going to bring it down for you. Just hang on with me. What makes the end time the end time? Even in the days of Paul, which was over 2,000 years ago, you're going to read in their writings in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Those guys were talking about the fact that they were in the end time. But 2,000 years have come and gone ever since the days of the apostles. The days of Peter, Paul, James and John and all those guys who thought that they were actually in the precipice of what we call the rapture right now? 2,000 years have come and the end time still hasn't started. What's going on? And they had plagues, they had persecutions, they had earthquakes back 2,000 years ago. Just simply because all those things are happening does not define what we call the end of the end of the end of the end times. What makes the end time the end time? I'm going to share with you right now. Watch with me on the graphic just a couple of points that I'm going to bring to the board so you can internalize this in your mind right now real quickly. Watch with me on the board. Glory to the name of the Lord. How many people can see this, these couple of points on the board right now with me? What is the end time? We're going to start this series of 2022 combination meals. End time snapshot by making sure that we nail this question right in our minds. The end time is not going to be the end time just because we're seeing earthquakes on the outside. The end time will be the end time because Daniel chapter 12 talks about it. In Daniel chapter 12, and I love brother Daniel because he actually started into started us into the study of eschatology. Which is going to be end time event, eschatological events, started from the book of Daniel. We're going to turn to that scripture in just a moment. But I want to pick certain points from Daniel chapter 12 from verse 4 to verse 5. To let you know that if you look at that scripture, the, the revelation that Daniel was given started from Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. And historical studies in between. If you read through the Septuagint and all of that. You are going to see that Peter, Paul, James, and John were not really in the end, 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 end times. But we right now in the 21st century are in the end times. Why? Because what Daniel talked about happened in our generation. And it's unfolding before our very eyes. Based on the scripture in Daniel chapter 12 from verse 4 to verse 5. Daniel says we are going to be in the end time when seals are opened. 
right? We're going to look at that scripture. I'm going to read it to you in just a moment. When seals are opened, it says that we are going to be in the end time. How do we know that? God gave an angel the commission and the revelation of the end time. He sent it over to Daniel. And but the angel gave him a little detail, but he couldn't get into extensive detail. And he told Daniel, go ahead and seal it up. But Daniel said, come on now, I want to know more about what you're talking about. And the angel told him, no, I can't delve into the details of it right now. Daniel, go your way, you're going to sleep in the dust in the field. I can't, I can't do this for you right now, Daniel, seal it up. And then Daniel kept on pressing the angel. The angel told him, okay, you know what? The, when the seals are going to be open in the end time. And when the seals get open, you are going to see two critical things happening in the atmosphere. He's going, he's, he told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, which we are going to be reading in a little bit. It said, knowledge will increase significantly in the earth's atmosphere. So mark that. If you're taking notes, please check this point number one. Point number one, to know that we are in the end time, you are going to see a significant increase in knowledge in the earth's atmosphere. And then on top of that, number two, he told him that there is going to be significant transportation movement to and fro the earth's atmosphere as a consequence of the opening of the seals. These two points talked about in Daniel chapter 12 from verse 4 to verse 5, which we are going to read shortly, makes our dispensation right now actually from 500 AD or 500 no, uh, 500 years ago, which is going to be uh, approximately 1580, about 500 years ago into the 21st century, makes this generation different from the time of Paul. For over 5,000 years of human history, 5,000 years ever since the Garden of Eden incident up to year 5,000, humanity was riding horses, Fighting on horseback, so riding donkeys. But ever since, like maybe 500 years ago to 2020 and 2021, we have more, more knowledge in this generation than we've had in 5,000 years of human history. Think about that. So in 5,000 years, we were riding horses and fighting on horsebacks and donkeys and just complete, absolute ignorance all through the planet. But in 500 years, compared 5,000 to 500 years, in 500 years, we have transportation, we have the cell phone technology, we have airplanes flying left, right, and center. We have arsenal and warfare, nuclear technology that we can literally self-implode with the knowledge we have right now in the 21st century in just 500 years. Oh, oh, we, we are just, uh, we're, we're so brilliant this gen. No, Albert Einstein was not more brilliant than the people who lived 5,000 years ago. Isaac Newton was not more brilliant than the people who lived 5,000 years ago. No, we are, these are just our scientists talking about it, just a few examples of them. Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein and, and all those guys who gave us the knowledge that we're building on right now to create computers, to make cell phone technology, to be able to fly airplanes. These are the guys who gave us the foundational knowledge and they lived in this just 500 years ago. Now these guys are not more brilliant than the people who will live during the time of Noah. But I come, we know so much of this generation is because some seals are open the heavens. What's the implication of opening seals in the heavens? You're going to ask yourself a question to start with. Why are seals locked up to start with? Anytime God says, seal up a scroll, he's trying to close knowledge. And that's why the, the, the angel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, seal it up until the time of the end. The, the, the scrolls are not going to be sealed up forever. The scrolls are going to be opened until on the time, during the time of the end, why? So that there can be significant knowledge in the Earth's atmosphere. Why? Think about that. Why is knowledge in the Earth's atmosphere important in this generation? Why is significant movement, transportation, back and forth important in this generation? I'm going to give you a clue. How many people can talk to their family members... 2,000 miles away without necessarily going over and riding on horsebacks. Yes, you can. 
How do you do that? Cell phone technology. Did you know that Noah couldn't do that? Did you know that Abraham couldn't do that? Now I'm going to ask you another question. So in the moment of doing this call right now, lots of you are all over the world. We got people calling in from France. We have New Jersey over there. We have New York over there. We have people calling different places. Over. And everybody can see me, can listen to me. Is it easier right now to spread the gospel of Jesus if we have technology and we have the ability to communicate beyond borders? Of course, it could be easier to do that. That's the reason God is going to allow significant knowledge in the end times. Why? Because God's trying to get a harvest of sons and daughters fully conformed to the image of Jesus. He couldn't do that 5,000 years ago. He couldn't do that 2,000 years ago. Why? Because seals hadn't been opened. So two points. you got to make sure you lock into your mind as we go into the series over here. Significant knowledge in the Earth's atmosphere. Significant transportation back and forth in the Earth's atmosphere. 500 years of so much knowledge that we can kill ourselves with what we know in this generation that people that lived before us didn't know about. 5,000 years of darkness and ignorance and no knowledge per capita compared to 500 years of significant knowledge. Which scriptures talk about all of this right now? We're going to turn to those scriptures, but please and please take a note of these points on the board right now and stay on board. Hallelujah. Scriptures I'm talking about right now, what is the end time uh, based on the pages of the Bible? Turn to Daniel chapter 12 right now. We'll take, take a look at the scriptures I'm talking about. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Daniel chapter 12. We're going to take a look at this one right now. We're going to see how beloved brother Daniel was trying to press for an answer. And the angel said, well, I can't, I can't give you more than this right now, Daniel. It's not for your time. Daniel chapter 12 from verse 4. He says, but you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. If you got a paper copy of the Bible, please do me a favor, underline that until the time of the end. Daniel 12 and 4. So it means that the scroll was not designed to be sealed up forever. It's just going to be sealed up until the end time. So it means during the end time, the scroll is going to be opened. The seals that locked up the scrolls are going to be opened. Now, of course, you don't see a physical scroll, but these are just symbolisms, the spiritual symbolism that certain things are going to happen. And of course, if you read through the, just fast forward a little bit right now, reading the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, that's exactly what Jesus said was going to happen in the end time. He started opening seals. So he says that you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Well, how would you know it's the time of the end? Now look at verse, keep reading with me. It says, many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Can you see over there? There's going to be significant transportation back and forth and back and forth. And why? For the purpose of knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood others, one of this, and he went on talking about it. But he said there's going to be significant movement back and forth the Earth's atmosphere, and there's going to be knowledge of the consequence of it at the time of the end. That's the reason I can say that. Now, if you study science and a little bit of history, when I start talking about people like um, Isaac Newton and Faraday and all these people who invented concepts and discovered electricity for us, for example. Uh, the people who invented and discovered how the airplane is going to operate, our cars are going to operate, the industrial revolution, the computer technology. All of these things I'm talking about, all this knowledge happened just in 500 years ago. And the earth had been around for the past 6,000 years. So for over 5,000 years, they didn't stumble ac across computer technology. They didn't stumble across electricity. They didn't stumble across all these things we're talking about right now. So is that evidence that some, something significant happened in the heavens? Of course. Because you know that nothing happens on the side of eternity that we call the earth if the Father is not permitted of it from the heavens. What I'm talking about right now that the Father is allowing this logical understanding of end time events to cross, cut across my mind. It's not because I'm more studious than my fathers. 
multiple people will live before me. They study the end time. They're just going to put the pieces together. It's not because I'm more intellectual. No, it's not because of that. It's because I'm living in a proof of my generation where the Bible says that the path of the righteous is going to be like as a light that shines brighter and brighter until the fullness of the day. I'm living in a generation where the path of the body of Jesus is going to be shining to the fullness of the day, number one. And then secondly, the meek will be taught the ways of the Lord. I humble my heart and I'm going to God and crying to God in meekness. Father, teach me your ways. And he's trying to open these things to me. Now, because I'm special. So what is the end time? It's the season during which knowledge will increase significantly in the earth's atmosphere. We read that in Daniel chapter 12 in verse 4. It's the season during which the remainder of biblical prophecies will be fulfilled. And it is the season during which this current age, the first heaven and earth, the first heavens and earth, will close. And that begs another question. What are you talking about the age closing over there? Some people are going to think, well, the age is going to close when the rapture occurs. And I beg to defer on that. The rapture does not define the close of the age. What defines the close of the age is what Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 20. Now turn to it, look at it. In Luke chapter 20, Yahushua talked about a key, a key characteristic of this age, this current age. When the Sadducees came to him and were asking him questions, you all know that story. Look at Luke chapter 20 and verse 27. I'm going to read this to you right now. In Luke chapter 20 and in verse 27, so the Sadducees who says there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves alive but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children, and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second one and then the third one married her in the same way. Uh, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were mar married to her? And Jesus replied, the people of this, ma of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to take, pa to take part in the age to come and in the resurrection of them will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Hold on line that. So a critical, critical characteristic of this age is the ability to procreate. And the Father started that in the book of Genesis. It said, multiply, fill the earth. That's a critical, critical quality of this age. Now, so this age is going to close when the Father withdraws that right away from humanity. You're not going to procreate in this order, and then there's going to be another age. Now, the question I'm going to ask to you is, will the rapture, the next rapture of Jesus results in the withdrawal of the right to procreate. And if you've read the book of Revelation a little bit, you're going to see that and the answer, of course, is no. Because right after the rapture, there's going to be the Antichrist, and he's going to rule a bunch of people who can have babies. <laughs> and then life is going to go on for a little bit, for about seven years, and then Jesus is going to come back and start a 1,000 year reign. And even during a 1,000 year reign, people are going to be having babies. So it means the age didn't close just because the rapture occurred. Correct. So where will the age close then? Based on what Jesus talked about in here, Luke chapter 20, when God finally withdraws the rights to procreate. And the Father is going to withdraw that right to procreate after the rapture, after the reign of the Antichrist, after the 1,000 year reign of Jesus, and actually after the battle of Armageddon, then after the 1,000 year reign of Jesus, then after the battle of Gog and Magog, when everything is done and over with, that's when the Father is going to close the age and we can see all of their God's, God says, I will make a new heaven and a new earth the old age is going to close. And another age is going to start. In that new age, there is not going to be procreation after this order. How do we feel God's creation with the billions and billions of stars and galaxies floating around space? How do we feel that and populate that with people? Well, the Father knows. <laughs> He's working alongside with Jesus right now because it says, In my Father's house, there, there are many mansions. 
And together with Yahushua, with the world living God, they are working a plan that is going to be more grand than the plan that we have right now in this current age. Why? Because we abused it. When you talk about land of Luda, yeah, I'm talking about, yeah, you heard me, right? I said, we abused the rights that God has given us to fill this creation with beautiful babies. Because all the babies you're seeing on this planet, they came out of the Father God, because the Father is the Father of all spirits. And he sends all these beautiful children into the earth's atmosphere. And their angels will behold the face of the Father, waiting for these babies to connect with their Creator. But as they get raised in homes and multiple families all over the world, these children, they, they get raised up to become enemies of God. And they came originally from the Father. Isn't that what happened left, right, and center all through the earth's atmosphere? Well, thank God God's trying to save a bunch of people. Look at everybody per capita. Little babies who came out from they get raised to become enemies of God. And the Father is going to be reaching out to them, reaching out to them. But no harvest, no significant harvest of righteousness from the Father because we abused the rights to nurture the seeds that were committed into our care who came from the Father in the fear and in the admonition of the Lord. So the Father is going to be well within his right if he says, well, I'm going to close this age and I'm going to start something else. <laughs> I say, yes, sir. You, you reserve the right to do that. Because you are deserving of a harvest of sons and daughters who are going to give you a harvest of righteousness in the earth. And he says, if the custodians of righteousness on the earth are sleeping, they can't they can replicate the image of righteousness on the side of eternity. I will close this order of poor creation and start another one. So when I'm talking about the age closing, put that in your mind. I'm not talking about just a rapture occurring and that's going to be the close of the age. No, the rapture is not going to close the age. What closes the age is the withdrawal of the rights to procreate. Luke chapter 20 from verse 27 to 40 talks about that. The second coming of Yahushua is one of the, one of the events of the end, but it is not the only event of the end. And it will not close the age. People will still be getting married and be given in marriage for at least a thousand years after the second coming of the Lord in a rapture. Isaiah chapter 65 is another scripture that talks about it. That during the 1,000 year reign of Jesus, people are going to believe to be well into their hundreds of years. And someone who dies in a hundred is going to be considered an infant. And that is talking about the 1,000 year reign of Yahushua. Isaiah 65. But we have been given a charge to know the season, even though we do not know the day and the hour. First Thessalonians chapter 4, take a look at it. So this end time over here, well, how do we know? I thought Jesus said we, we can't know the day or the hour. Yeah, but we can know the season of it. And that's the revelation that God has poured into the at earth's atmosphere right there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 13, take a look at this. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, with loud commands, with the voice of an archangel, with a trumpet call, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left are going to be caught up together to be with them and with the Lord in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And so encourage one another, therefore encourage one another with his words. Now, brothers, of all times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well, we went in the first, we're going to talk about all of the scriptures today. Oh, well, maybe not everything, because it's going to take about five hours to pour all this out. <laughs> we're getting ready for some actions over there. <laughs> but we're going to start it today. Hallelujah. So we know that critically, seals need to be open in the end times. And how do we know seals are being open? We talked about it. Knowledge has increased significantly. Significantly since 1500 to 21st century, and this is not possible without the opening of the seals. People can go to and fro more easily now to create a platform for the for the spread of the gospel to give the Father a harvest of righteousness. 
Daniel was given an overview of the end time, starting from Daniel chapter 7. He was given insights into the details that occurred between 500 to 0 BC, but he was not given the details of subsequent events. He was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. Daniel 12, Daniel 12 9 talked about that. These are the seals that Jesus opened in the book of Revelation. Now quickly turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. So we, we looked at the book of Daniel just a few moments ago. We talked about seals, uh, locking up a certain scroll. And then all of a sudden, Revelation chapter 6, right now, Yahushua says, when the end time starts, I'm going to open seal 1 and seal 2 and seal. Come on. Look at it. Revelation chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice, like, a th like thunder, come. And I looked, and there before me was a white horse, and its rider held a bow, and it was given a crown, and he rode out conquering, bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red horse. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth, to make men kill each other, and it was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before was a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. And then I heard what sounded like the voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Do not damage the oil and the wine. And he goes on and on and on talking about how there are not the seven seals that are going to be open. Seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four. Doesn't that make sense right now why the book of Daniel is going to say seal it up until the time of the end? Makes absolute sense. The book of Daniel seal it up. The book of Revelation tells us in the end time the seals are going to be open. But we're going to walk through the logical events, the events that will transpire, and how those things will transpire through the evidence of history that we study in our generation, especially for, five, for the past 500 years. We're going to walk through all of that in the series by the grace of God. Stay on board with me. Now, the, the, the detail that the angel gave Daniel, some of those things happened already. And that's another challenge that some of our brothers are going to have. They're going to read some of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And they're going to assume that those kind of things are going to be happening in the 21st century. No, they already occurred. So, for example, in Daniel chapter 8, you are going to see, um, I'm not going to turn to it for the sake of time. How Daniel was given insights into certain kingdoms that will occur prior to everlasting righteousness. Those kingdoms are going to be the kingdom of Media, Persia, and Greece. And when Greece happens, there's going to be the, uh, the, the, the kingdom of Greece is going to be divided into four kingdoms. Now, all of those happened and occurred uh, prior to the birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago. That's Daniel 8. Daniel 8 has already occurred. Don't try to put Daniel 8 in the 21st century. Some of our brothers are getting into that era. They're going to say, what's well, not No, don't do that. Daniel 8 occurred already. Because if you read um, your history books, you are going to see how Alexander the Great came into power before the coming of Jesus, and he conquered the whole world. And God allowed him to do that because... Uh, he was going to establish the Greek language so that uh, people can communicate more easily. He provided the platform for that. But then he died, and then his kingdom was split into four kingdoms. And then here came the Romans right after that. And God is working slowly and steadily, steadily to create the infrastructure that he is going to be using to spread the gospel of Jesus so he can have a harvest of righteousness. So all of that has occurred. Daniel 8 occurred in the past. But then Daniel 9 came right now, and then Daniel 9 started talking about the concept of everlasting righteousness, which was fulfilled with the birth, death, and resurrection of Yahushua. Daniel 9, 27 occurred by the abomination that caused desolation, which was prophesied according to um, the book of Daniel, and it occurred A.D. 70 with the, with the invasion of the Romans to devastate the temple prophesied by Jesus in Luke chapter 21. Some of those things have occurred. It's in the book of Daniel. I'm not going to turn to it, but you got your study notes of it. Please turn to it later. Now, Daniel 10 and Daniel 11 talks about the king of the north, which is Syria, the king of the south, which is Egypt, 
this was fulfilled as documented in the writings of Maccabees and the Septuagint, historically, that occurred as well. So, another prophecy about abomination that caused desolation from Daniel occurred, and this occurred about 167 BC, when the king of the north set himself up as God of the temple and destroyed the temple of Zerubbabel. How many people remember the temple of Zerubbabel? So when the people of Judah went into captivity in Babylon, because of the sins of their fathers, they spent 70 years in captivity. And then after they came out of captivity, people like Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, they built a temple. They called that temple, Temple of Zerubbabel. And he happened, all that happened about 500 BC. And that temple stood firmly up until 167 BC when the king of the north came and burned it down again. These are historical evidences which you are not going to see in the popular copy of the Bible. It's there in the Septuagint and historically it's there as well if you study history a little bit. But Jews like Maccabeus, that's where they got the book of Maccabees from, revolted against this entity between 167 BC to 46 BC. They started fighting him and challenging him. So the king of the north, who was from Syria, he came over and devastated the, the temple of Zerubbabel and burned it down. But some Jews like Maccabeus says, no, you can't do this. And that fighting went on from 167 BC to about 46 BC. And then, after 47 BC, they built a temple called the Temple of Herod, between 46 BC and 0 BC, they built a temple called the Temple of Herod. Now what happened was, Maccabeus was a Jew, and any time he's going to pray to God, say, God, please save us from the Syrians, and save us from the King of the North, where God's going to give them victory. And there were multiple campaigns like that, that he didn't push him back on this King of the North. What I'm talking about, if you got a copy of the Septuagint, you are going to see all of there in the book of Maccabees. Well, if you're a student of history, type into your Google search over there, type in the King of the North, you're going to read all of this. What I'm talking about is public knowledge. So Maccabeus challenged the King of the North, saying, no, you're not going to burn down a temple. And they fight him, they're going to win some battles, they're going to lose some battle, battles. But Maccabeus was getting, was getting tired, and then he heard that the Romans had superior firepower. So he sent an envoy to the Romans... And he said, hey, if we sign a pact with you, are you guys going to come and just help us and kick out the king of the north a little bit? So the Romans felt, well, we can help a little bit. So they signed a pact with Maccabeus, and that introduced the Romans to the nation of Israel. Because you may be asking yourself the question, how come Pontius Pilate was reigning in Israel? He's a Roman. How did he get over there to the nation of Israel? Well, he, well maybe come over there. That's the reason history is important. The Romans were not part of the nation of Israel until Maccabeus signed this contract with the Romans. He signed a contract as he was trying to look for a way to protect his nation. I mean, they've done a lot of battles against the kingdom, and surely the Romans came around and they started helping. But then that provided the platform for the devastation again that happened in AD 7 when the Romans came and burned the temple of Herod down again. Why? Because of the stubbornness of the Jews. In not accepting the testimony of Yahushua. They say, no, let the blood of this man be on us, crucify him. They crucify the Lord of glory. And Jesus said, because of that, this temple that you see will be reduced down to rubbles. All these are fulfilling the prophecies which occurred in the past. So Jews like Maccabeus revolted against the entity called the King of the North between 167 B.C. and 46 B.C. The Temple of Herod was finally destroyed just like Jesus prophesied as documented in John chapter 2. Now there are cardinal scriptures that will put all of this together for us. There's going to be Daniel 7 to Daniel chapter 12. There's going to be Zechariah chapter 13 to Zechariah chapter 14. There's going to be 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Revelation from chapter 1 to chapter 22, Ephesians chapter 5, Romans chapter 8. And all of the scriptures for your information are going to be synergized by end time snapshots. Five messages that I'm going to be talking about. There's a lot I need to pour out. If I were to go keep on talking like this, it's going to take us five hours. And we don't have that time just in the session of our service. But if you get a chance, you can connect with us on YouTube. All those messages, they're going to be published over there. So how do we find synergy with all the scriptures? I 
I've given you eternal scriptures already. I'm, man, I'm sure they're going to be going back from saying, come on, this is too fast. I know. <laughs> I apologize for that. The reason is there's a lot that i got to pour out, and the word of God is like fire in my bones. I can't slow down. There's a lot i got to pour out. It's just i got to. That's the reason I created study books. That's the reason I'm putting something on YouTube over there. You can take your time with what I'm talking about right now. You can pause your device later at a later date and rewind me again, make me say it all over again. But I've got a little nine minutes to pour this out by the grace of God. So how do we find synergy? What is the relationship between 2 Thessalonians and the rest of biblical prophecies to start with? Turn to 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to give you an example that the same Spirit of the Lord who inspired Brother Paul to document 2 Thessalonians for us is the same Spirit of the Lord who inspired the book of Revelation documented by John the Beloved. Now 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Take a look at that. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord to God. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes. Glory, 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 glory to God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 right now. Take a look at it. And in verse 1, you are going to see how Second Thessalonians is going to map off to the book of Revelation, Revelation 6. It says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now how brothers a few years ago got a hold of this particular scripture right now and they, and they start telling us, can't you see that, can't you see the rapture is not going to occur until the Antichrist comes first? Can't you see what the Bible said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 over there? The coming of the Lord will not occur until the man of lawlessness has been revealed. But what about this coming of the Lord? It's not talking about the rapture. Really? Yep. This particular coming of the Lord over there is talking about the 1,000 year reign coming of Jesus. This is not talking about the rapture over here. How do you know that? Read it in context. Just like I said numerous times, one of the great services that the body of Christ does to the body of Christ is the fact that they don't read the Bible in context. They're going to take a scripture over here, merge it over to another scripture over there, and then they create disastrous revelations which will hurt the testimony and the cause of Jesus and the lives of people. Don't do that. A workman is going to be faithfully required to faithfully devour the word of truth. Read the Bible in context. What kind of comment is he talking about over there? He didn't stop 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. He kept on talking about it. They just were writing letters to them. Read it in context. Keep reading right now. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God and is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Correct. What kind of comment is he talking about? Keep reading with me. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things and now you know what is holding him back. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds him back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I don't like that. So the Bible says that the Antichrist is not going to come until somebody is taken out of the way. Now, that taken out of the way is going to be the rapture experience, which the book of Revelation, Revelation 12, chapter 12, talks about. Because the book of Revelation tells us that when the man-child company is ejected out of here, then the Antichrist is going to come in Revelation chapter 13. So this kind of comment that Jesus, that Paul is talking about over there, is not talking about the rapture coming. Coming, he's talking about another coming that's going to occur for the one thousand year reign. Keep reading with me. He says over there, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken up out of the way. 
And when the lawless one is revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So the coming of Jesus is talking about over there. It's not coming to snatch us out of here. The coming of Jesus is to destroy the lawless one. And which scripture talks about the destruction of the lawless one? Now look at Revelation chapter 13. So you can read it in context and then you are going to see additional details over there. Look at it. Hallelujah. In Revelation chapter 13 and in verse 11. I saw heaven standing open and there before was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but him. He is dressed and talking about the characteristic of the Lord. It says, out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a high scepter. And then he says over there, I'm going to keep reading. Um... And it says, then I saw in verse 19 of Revelation chapter 19, then I saw uh, the beast and his kings and uh, of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider of the horse and his army. But the beast was captured in him and with him the false prophet who had performed regular signs on his behalf. And with the signs he had deluded those who received the mark of the beast. The two of them were taken alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur and the rest of they were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider of a horse. Can you see how they're going to die over there? That's what Second Thessalonians is trying to describe over there. He says the Lord will overthrow the, the, the lawless one with the, with the brightness of his coming. So that particular coming is that Revelation 19 coming, which Jesus is going to come and destroy the Antichrist and establish a 1,000 year reign talked about. Revelation 19, Revelation 20. That's the coming he's talking about. Then the coming of the lawless one will be in, all, in accordance with different kinds of the works of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil to deceive those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe a lie and so that they will all be condemned. Who will not believe the truth, but the light of the wickedness. So when you're written in context, you are going to understand... These points, which I'm going to read to you right now. Number one, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 12 is perfectly synergistic with the rest of biblical prophecies. Why? Number one, mystery of lawlessness. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work starting from the dear Paul. That's what verse 7 of that chapter talked about. So during the days of Paul, it said that the Antichrist is already here. The spirit of lawlessness is already at work, but not in flesh. So there was no body that categorically the devil had baptized so much to become Antichrist personified. Right from the dear Paul. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean that there is no spirit in the atmosphere which is anti-Christ. And the word Christ over there is going to be anti the purpose of the Messiah, anti the purpose of Jesus on the earth. That spirit is on the earth's atmosphere and is still right now in the 21st century in the earth's atmosphere. What's the purpose of that spirit? The purpose of that spirit is to block the purpose of Jesus, which is to set, to set God's people free from their sins. It's called the spirit of disobedience of the air. It's called the infrastructure of Babylon, an atmosphere. It's going to make you lukewarm. It's going to make you confused. It's going to make you tradition. It's going to block. It's doing all kinds of things for one objective. Jesus is not going to set his people free from their sins. That's what he's doing. He's already at work. And he started right from the time of Paul. That's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talked about. Then number 2. As a consequence of the, 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 the operation of this lawless spirit of the Antichrist, a great falling away will occur because of the influence of lukewarmness, the infrastructure of Babylon, and the impact of the spirit of the Antichrist. Which scripture says that? Matthew 24. That's going to be another scripture that we all going to synergize together with 2 Thessalonians. We're going to do that. If you remember, Matthew 24 it says, The love of men will wax cold. And he says, many, not just the love of a few. Why? There's going to be a great falling away because of that. That's number two. 
The number three point you got to understand for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 2, the third point you got to understand is that the force which restrains the Antichrist is going to be the man child company talked about in Revelation 12. The Revelation chapter 12, let's take a look at it. So some of people may not read the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 12 right there. It's going to talk about how the force that's holding the Antichrist is going to be snatched up out of here. And then the Antichrist is going to come in Revelation chapter 13. Look at Revelation chapter 12. It says in verse 1, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in hell. There was an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the skies and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and his throne. Can you see 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 here in Revelation 12? Revelation 12, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, He that is withholding the Antichrist is going to keep on withholding the Antichrist until it's taken out of the way. He's talking about a body of believers fully conformed to the stature of Jesus. The presence of the spiritual force in the atmosphere right now is making it difficult for the devil to baptize somebody and become the Antichrist personified. And that, that person, the body of Jesus, is what is called the man-child company over here. And if you're a part of that, congratulations to you. When the rapture occurs, that's when the Antichrist can come. Revelation 12 talked about that, and that's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talked about as well. Synergy of scriptures. Can you see it? All right. So that's number three that we can see over there. And number four, the force of the man-child company that had been restraining the Antichrist since the day of Paul is going to be taken away in a rapture, which is the second coming of the Messiah. The first coming of Jesus happened 2,000 years ago to atone for the sins of humanity to establish the concept of everlasting righteousness. But he is going to be coming in another coming for the rapture of the Mantar Company. And then it's going to come a third time to come rule over here. There are three significant comings of Jesus, which we can see through the scriptures. But this one talked about over there, the snatching away, that's the second coming, which we call the rapture. And then the fifth point is that the man of lawlessness, which is the Antichrist, will be revealed based on Revelation 12 that I just read to you. That's another point you can get from your study notes over there on page 138. Then number six, the day of the Lord, which is going to be the third coming of the Lord, and the millennial reign of Christ will occur, and Yahushua will come and destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet with the breath of his mouth in a battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is talked about from Revelation chapter 6 up unto Revelation chapter 19, and God, Jesus, is going to come with the army of heaven, slay that cat over there with the breath of his nostrils. <laughs> Oh, but I thought Jesus is a is a, is a little lamb. No. In his third coming, it's not going to be a little lamb. No, no. <laughs> his eyes are going to be blazing with fire like the sun over there. And some dingoes, they're going to carry their machine guns and try to fight Jesus. In the 1,000 year rain coming, he's going to step out of here. He's going to say, yeah, come, come, come all the birds over here. Come gouge themselves on the flesh of generals and kings. Come and take them out. The one you call Jesus is going to do that, correct? Because his name is Yahushua. The lion and the lamb is going to take him out, big time. The third coming of Jesus is going to do that. Point number six. And gathering all the saints to reign together with Yahushua in Revelation chapter 20. All of these you can see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And they map out to the events talked about in the book of Revelation. Synergy of scriptures. Another example of the synergy of scriptures, which I'm going to read to you right now, is going to be in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, starting from verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus and were asking him and to, to take a look at the magnificence of the temple that Herod built after they conquered the king of the north that I was telling you historically a few moments ago. 
And the disciples are looking at, come on now, oh, Jesus, look at this big mountain, big, big tabernacle over here. Matthew 24, verse 1. This is going to be very important, so I'm going to slow down to the best of my ability, but make sure you're on the line right now, get your pencils and mark your Bible with it. Glory to God. Matthew 24, in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. The temples had the temple had large and magnificent buildings. Say, hey, Jesus, can you see those buildings over there? And Yahushua told them, do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And that startled Peter, James, and John. What are you talking about, Jesus? You see those great buildings of Herod? The temple of Herod is going to be burned down? What are you talking about? Come on. Huh? And then they came around and started asking Jesus, has this, they, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Underline that and write question number one. In other words, when will the temple buildings be destroyed just like you talked about? And then, what will be the sign of your coming? Underline that, write question number two. You want to know, when are you going to come, come back now? You said the temple's going to be destroyed. Okay, when will that happen? All right, and when are you going to come back, Jesus? Question number two. And then question number three, what will be the sign of the close of the age? Three questions. Can you see it? There were three questions that were asked of Jesus in Matthew 24. Take a look at it. From verse 2 to verse 3, three questions. The first question is, when will the temple buildings be destroyed? And we know that occurred during AD 70, and Yahushua gave them pointers. Subsequent verses of Matthew 24, he starts to answer those questions in a logical sequence. When will the temple buildings be destroyed? When are you going to come back and get us, Jesus? And what will be the sign of the close of the age? Three questions that they asked of Yahushua. And Yahushua, being an intellectual <laughs> person, he, he answers their questions just like that. Now look at the answers right here. In verse 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For men will come in my name, claiming that I, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So this is trying to answer question number three right now, because the end of the age is going to give them an overview of what's going to happen. Then he's going to start picking pockets to answer question number two, question number one. Watch with me. It says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all of these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, men will turn away from the faith and will betray each other and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of the majority will wax cold, but he who stands firmly to the hand will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. In verse Four to verse 14 writes over there answer to question number three. They wanted to know when the age is going to close. So Yahushua gives them a synopsis of events that will transpire in a condensed version to close the age. And that's exactly what Revelation chapter 6 talked about. Hallelujah. So the disciples asked Jesus these three questions. When this destruction of the temple will happen, what will be the sign of Jesus coming? What will be the sign of the close of the age? Matthew 24, from verse 4 to verse 14, Jesus answered question number 3 to present an overview of end time events. And when you compare this to all the parts of scriptures, you're going to see Luke 21, 8 to 9, talks about the same thing. And Revelation chapter 6, up until chapter 11, talked about the same thing as well. And then starting from verse 15 of Matthew 24, to verse 22, Jesus answers question number one to highlight events that will result in the destruction of the temple. So subsequently right now in verse 15, that's not talking about what is happening right now in the 21st century. 
from verse 50, which I'm going to read to you right now, had already occurred with the invasion of the Romans. They burned down the temple buildings, just like Jesus prophesied. Starting from verse 15 right now. Look at it. So when you see the see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through prophet Daniel, let those let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of it. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress on equal from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equal again. If those days have not been cut short, no one will survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days are going to be shortened. At that time, now, this from verse 15 to verse 22 is talking about what happened in AD 7 to destroy the temple. Yahushua told those boys over there, when I get out of here, it's going to get really rough. So go to the mountains. Don't make, make sure you don't stay back in your house because these people are going to be punished because of what they did to my testimony. Which scripture further confirms that? Now look at the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 21 and from verse 8 is another rendition of Jesus' answer to this question. Look at Luke 21 right now and in verse 8. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Many people get something from it. Luke 21 and verse 8. It says, He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. Uh, for many will come in my name. Claiming that I am he, the time is near, do not follow them. When you hear wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen, but the end will not be right away. And then in verse 20, just to let you know that this is talking about question number two specifically, to the destruction of the temple buildings. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out of there. Let those in the country not enter into the city, for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. So all that great distress that is talking about, do not think that that's going to occur in the future anymore. No, that's already occurred in the past. Why he occurred when Jesus left out of here, the Romans came and distressed the nation of Israel, burned down the temple building, A.D. 7. It's historical record. And you can't get all of this historical record just by reading your Bible alone. You've got to study history a little bit. Why? Because the end time events that Jesus talked about, some prophecies had been fulfilled and some prophecies will be fulfilled. Now, how would you know which of those prophecies have been fulfilled if you don't study history? That's the reason history is important. So Matthew chapter 24 in verse 15 verse 20, Yahushua answers question number two, which talks about when the temple buildings are going to be destroyed. And that occurred in AD 70. And then starting from verse 23 to verse 25, Jesus answers right now. Oh, uh, uh, Matthew 15, 22 answers question number one. Pardon me. Then starting from verse 23 to 35, and Jesus answered question number two to highlight the events that will directly precede the next rapture, which is the second coming of the Lord. And that is going to be comparable to Luke 21, 25 to 33 and Revelation chapter 6 from verse 12 to verse 17. Now let's look at um, uh, Matthew 22, uh, 24 to 20, uh, 23. Yeah, Matthew 24 and verse 23 right now real quick. We'll take a look at it. So talking about the sign of his coming right now, he starts to answer the second question in verse 23. He says, then if anyone comes to you and says, look, here is the Christ, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive even the elect if it were possible. See, I have told you. So if anyone tells you, um, here he is out in the desert, do not go out. Here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning that comes from the east and is visible in the west, so will it be the coming of the Son of Man. Where, the, where there is the carcass, they will, the vultures will gather immediately after the distress of those days. Now this distress over there is another kind of distress. 
He's not talking about the distress when Jesus is telling them, you go, go to the mountains right now because the Romans they can come burn down this building. But then he's talking about another amount of distress. Now what's this kind of distress? He says the sun is going to be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the skies and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now have you seen that in your generation just yet? No. Oh, but I thought we saw the blood moon. Correct? We saw the blood moon, but did you see the sun darkened? No. Did you see the stars falling from the skies just yet? No. Did you see heavenly bodies shaking? No. So it means Jesus can come until all those things have happened right now. He says, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. So these events, in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, heavenly bodies shaking right now, need to occur before the rapture occurs. Ah. Uh, it says, they will see the Son of Man coming down on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elects from the four winds of the of, from the four winds from one end of the heavens up unto another. Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as anyone can can you see the answer to question number two over there? Read it, read it, you're gonna see it. And I'm not flying through this. I know I'm not flying, but I gotta keep going. So compare Luke chapter 21 from verse 25 to verse 33. And this event was, was talked about in Revelation chapter 6 as well. Look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12 right now. Take a look at it real quickly. How many people know that Revelation chapter 6 is Brother John's explanation of Matthew 24? Yep. When Matthew documented his answer in Matthew 24, did you know that John was there as well listening to Jesus? Yes, he was because it was a part of disciples. So the disciples called Jesus to point his attention to the buildings and Yahushua starts telling them this is what's going to happen. The temple buildings are going to be destroyed. This is what's going to happen during my second coming. This is what's going to happen to close the hedge. Did you know that John the Beloved was listening as well? But in the Gospel of John, you are not going to see any end time description over there. Our committee didn't document it because God gave him something more grand, a complete, a more complete version of what Jesus talked about in the book of Revelation. That's the reason we're going to read Revelation chapter 6 right now. So what John talked about in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, has to map up to what Matthew talked about in Matthew 24, in Luke 21, and in Mark 13. It's going to map up together. Now look at Revelation chapter 6, especially from verse 12 right now. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth. Can you see Matthew 24 here in the book of Revelation? Can you see that mapping of scriptures together? It says the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Can you see Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12? He says over there, the sky receded like a scroll. Every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man, he caves among the rocks of the mountains and then they call to the mountains and the rocks fall on us hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne so if they saw somebody when there is a sign in the sun and a sign in the moon and a sign in the stars and the heavenly bodies start to shake somebody's going to come and they're going to see it but the carnal and the unbelieving, they're going to go to run a hiding caves. That's what's going to happen. So fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. That's how we know this is Jesus. For the great day of his wrath has come and we can stand. That's when the rapture occurs and he can put the maps up to Matthew 24. Can you see it? I believe you can. So that's another example of synergy of scriptures. Why should we know about the end time? God asked us to discern the times and not be ignorant of the season of the coming of, of the Lord in a rapture. First Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 1 to 6, talks about that. 
In this understanding should position the believer to walk circumspectly and move in the direction of the positive destiny that we're talking about. So how do we identify the season? Exercise complete faith principles for complete revelation knowledge based on Proverbs chapter 2. Cry out for insight before you study. Don't just open your Bible and think the Bible is going to be an intellectual book. No, you're going to miss it. It's going to be multiple spirits talking to you, influence of lying spirits. God talks, the devil talks as well. If you want to shield yourself from the influence of lying spirits, you've got to cry out for insight. Which scripture says that? Proverbs chapter 2. Take a look at it. Ask God, teach me your ways. You don't cry out for God, you're going to come out with 1988 prophecy, and Y2K prophecy, and 2015 prophecy, and everything's going to fall in bang, 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 bang. Come on now. Proverbs chapter 2. Take a look at it. It says, if you cry out for insight, raise your voice for understanding. In verse 3. And cry out for insight, raise your voice for understanding, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And then if you search for those hidden treasures, you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge. Did you see that you gotta cry out before you start searching? Correct. That's how we got this. I didn't start reading my Bible before I cried out. I cried out to God, crying out to God. I'm getting confused right now. They told me this is going to happen in 1988. It didn't happen. Why 2K didn't happen? 2015. What's the problem? Open my eyes. I stepped out of the tents of traditions and denomination I was raised in so I could see clearly. And God said, I showed them all of this. I didn't learn this from anybody. I learned it by crying out of God. You got to do the same. You say, exercise, complete faith principles. For complete revelation, not just going to be praying for it, desiring for it, believing for it, and then you can now study the scriptures. And when you study the scriptures, God's going to show you, well, 2 Thessalonians coming over there is talking about Revelation 19 coming. Matthew 24, maps up to Revelation chapter 6. You are going to start seeing the light of the Holy Spirit when you cry out for inside with an attitude of meekness. Because the meek will be taught the ways of the Lord. Cry out for inside somebody in the name of Jesus. And as we do that, God will give us additional nuggets to understand that there is a structure for the book of Revelation. Many people, especially the body of Christ, do not read the book of Revelation because they think it's too scary. Oh, if I were to touch that book of Revelation, there's so many scary things, my finger's going to burn. No, the book of Revelation is a book of blessings. And it was given to you by the one you call Jesus. Look at it. The book of Revelation is the most glorious book in the New Testament. It starts with a blessing for you. It says in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you see the revelation of the Antichrist over there? No. Oh, but I thought he talked about the Antichrist. Yes, but it's not predominantly the revelation of the Antichrist. No, Jesus gave this book to us so we can read it. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Did you see blessings associated with reading the book of Revelation? It is a curse are you going to be when you read the book of Revelation. It is a your fingers are going to burn when you read the book of Revelation. Oh, don't talk to space because I'm going to cut your fingers off. No. He says, blessed is the one who reads it. So you got to read it. Oh, but I'm reading it and I don't understand. Yes, you got to cry out firstly. That's that. It's going to be in that order. Proverbs chapter 2 says, you cry out to God for insight. Says God, open my eyes. Just like, Mo, just like uh, Moses cried out to God, Exodus chapter 33. Teach me your ways so I can find favor before you. Solomon did the same thing. David did this. All the great people who knew God a little bit. They didn't know God just by studying. Him. They knew God by crying out to God firstly and then they studied. That's how you're going to do the book of Revelation. You're going to cry out firstly in meekness. Humble yourself. Say, Father, please teach me your ways. I want to be taught the ways of the Lord God. I'm stepping out right now. The traditions of men open my eyes. Let the skills fall off my eyes, God. Open my ears so I can understand. Why? 
Because God's people are going to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, see here, chapter 4 and verse 6 talks about that. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You didn't say the enemy or the devil's people. It says, God's people destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So imagine us not knowing all those details about the book of Revelation. Now, we've been talking about the ODP for about five years right now. We're going to be scared chickens right now, left, right, left, right, and center from everybody. <laughs> I can't imagine myself not cutting across this revelation in a logical sequence and living in the 21st century. My heart would have failed me a long time ago because I, I can't take it. And that's what's happening to lots of our brothers and sisters. They are running scared. They don't know what's going to happen. Oh, what's going to happen to us? No. We know what's going to happen if you dare listen to us. It's called the ODP combination. It open your ears, somebody. So the book of Revelation is a book of blessing. Pray to God for insight and then study it. And as you study it, you are going to come to terms to see that the chapter 1, the first chapter of the book of Revelation, is a commission of the book of Revelation. And it's a revelation of future events, which actually started A.D. 81 and then up until the 21st century. What am I talking about? The book of Revelation wasn't given to us in 2020. No. The book of Revelation was not given to us in 1988. No. The book of Revelation wasn't given to us in 1920. No. The book of Revelation was given to us A.D. 81, between A.D. 81 and A.D. 96. By beloved brother John. God showed John a movie. I was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. And God showed him a movie. He said, write it down, send it, to the seven, send it over to seven churches. And that event occurred about 80, 81 to 80, 96. Um, how did he know it was 80, 91, 80, 81? History. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You got to go back and start studying. When was the book of Revelation given over? He was given over. To beloved brother John in AD 81 to AD 96, and Jesus talked about future events from that standpoint, which is going to be approximately about 2,000 years ago. So that should let you know between the now, between now and the past 2,000 years is what Jesus calls future. So it means that there is a potential for some of those things to have happened, and of course the answer is yes, as we're going to see next week. That some of the seals talked about the book of Revelation, four of those have been opened in our generation, especially for the past 500 years. We're going to break it down for you, which started with the Reformation in Germany. Now look at it. Revelation chapter 1 establishes the book of Revelation as a prophetic book, which is going to be for future events, not for past events, the book of Daniel. No. The book of Revelation is not going to be talking about what happened in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 8. No everlasting righteousness already occurred. But going forward right now, the book of Revelation, that understanding is important. If you have that understanding, you are not going to juxtapose Daniel chapter 8 to the king of the north and put it back in the book of Revelation again. No, you're not going to do that. Well, some of our brothers are going to do that. Well, they're going to say, well, the king of the north is going to come get us now. Can't you see? No, that already occurred, guys. Come on, man. Then Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 was written to the churches, churches of Ephesus and Pergamum and Smyrna, to motivate those churches towards purity, for future generations to learn from them, for us to maintain our influence as salt and light. And then Revelation chapter 4 was given to the churches to describe God's throne, to create an appreciation for the magnificence of God, to help you worship God and steer in that direction. And you see the beauty of the throne of God. You're not going to want to settle for anything less. That's the reason chapter 4 was given to us. And then chapter 5, we see that only Jesus, the Lamb, has the right to open the scroll, which was locked up from Daniel chapter 12, and which is going to be open the book of Revelation. And then chapter 6 up until chapter 11 talked about the overview of the events as Jesus opened the seals one at a time. God presents an overview of events that will transpire in the end time. Uh, and noted that the kingdoms of the world has returned to God in Revelation chapter 11. And then Revelation chapter 12 and verse to chapter 22 talks about the detail of end time events. And this is God's way of writing books. Why? Because God presents an overview of creation in Genesis 1, 26, 27, and later expanded all the detail in Genesis chapter 2. 
Therefore, it is not going to be out of reason to believe that the book of Revelation was written with a similar structure. So what's the order of events right now, which we're going to delve into deeper next week? Take it from me. The order of events. Seal number one is going to be a supposed conqueror. Seal number two is going to be conflicts on the earth. Seal number three is going to be scarcity on the earth. Seal number four is going to be widespread death, which is where we are right now, starting from 2020 and going forward. Where is seal number four, guys? How do you know that? Wait until next. We're going to break it down further for you. Seal number five, the crown of the martyrs. Seal number six, there's going to be cosmic disturbances, and then the rapture is going to occur. Seal number seven, there's going to be judgment on the nations, and the blowing of the seven trumpets, and the subsequent pouring out of God's bowl of wrath. And then subsequently, there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. The age is going to close, and the Father is going to start anew. Glory to God. Oh, come on, let's go deeper into it. My time is off right now for today. <laughs> We're going to talk about details of the order of events starting from next week. You can catch up with us on YouTube or come on, study your end time snapshots over there by the grace of God. How many people got something from it? End time snapshot, part one. There are going to be five parts to the series still on board with us. I'm going to share with you certain things that will get you not to be scared, but to position you for victory on the side of eternity, knowing it through all. That even though the mountains may fall to the heart of the sea, the God of, God of Jacob is our refuge in this end time. God didn't give us the book of Revelation and end time prophecies to get us scared. He gave us the book of Revelation so that we can be ready. That's the reason we wrote discipleship studies for the rapture ready. Listen to it. Watch it. Read it. Do everything you can to get the best out of it. Say to God because victory is for you in the name of Jesus. How many of you got something from it? I sure hope so. All right. It's my custom. I'm not going to give a viewing audience an opportunity to connect with the Lord. And this is going to be based on what the Bible says. It's going to get you ready to go in the direction of heaven. Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21. Take a look at it. It says, Not everyone who says to the Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Now this passage of scripture lets us know that there are going to be two things categorically necessary to make it over to the kingdom of heaven, calling Jesus Lord and living to please the Father. It's not simply calling Jesus Lord, and it's not trying to please the Father without calling Jesus Lord. No, both are important. You call him Lord, Master, Boss, and Savior. What's going to save you from your sins and you make a quantum decision to live to please the Father, then you are going to be on your way to heaven. That's the complete gospel message. Any other thing apart from that, apart from that is going to result in lukewarmness. And that's the lukewarm gospel. But if you want to make that decision right now, I'm going to ask you to say these words after the based on Matthew 7, 21, 23. And let's get you started together with the rest of us. Say after this, say, Lord Jesus, I realize that I've been a sinner, living by my wits and powers, calling myself my own Lord. I repent of this sin, and I ask you to forgive me. Please save me from my sins. I call you Lord, Master. Boss and Savior, I believe you died and you were resurrected to save me from my sins. Please give me a new heart to please the Father. And I want to thank you for saving me. I am born again from the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And by your grace, your help, your mercy, I will live to please the Father and make heaven my home. Thank you for saving me. I am born again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Glory to God. Congratulations. Saints, brothers and sisters of the Lord, if you pray that prayer with me, you are born again. Congratulations to you. Welcome to the family of God. Now, if you pray that prayer, please let us know about it. Send us an email at inquiry at heroesmart.com. I'm going to send you additional steps, additional resources to get you started on this newly found faith. But something divine has happened in your heart right now. I'm telling you something. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, is a new creation. All things on the inside has to be. Behold, all things have become new. Something changed in your heart if you pray this prayer with me sincerely from your heart. Congratulations to you, friends, brothers, and sisters in the Lord. Welcome to God's family. Hallelujah. Please go ahead and send us that email, and we will send you additional resources free of charge. I'm not going to charge you anything for it. I'm going to send it to you free of charge to build your faith and strengthen your core. Bring down a hero in you, make a champion out of you. Sing to God. Congratulations. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, now, for the rest of our friends and families who may want to take a copy of the study notes on the board, I'm going to step away from the screen for just a little bit. It gives you plenty of opportunities to pause your device and take a copy of the study notes on the board. And I'll be back right after 10 seconds. chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board. I believe you took a chance just to quick a snapshot of the study notes on the board. It's going to come out for you on our YouTube audience by the grace of God. Well, I want to thank you for staying on board with us. This is End Time Snapshot, part one. Uh, we're not done with the study of end times just yet. Let's come back next because I've got a lot of more things to talk about. But until next time, remember God cares about you and so do we. Jesus is Lord. Stay blessed. Amen.